They shaped my, my belief about the importance of facing hard history um, and, and studying all of history. So studying the innovative, the, the positive, and the challenging and the hard, even when it's uncomfortable, especially when it's uncomfortable. Heated political debates and culture wars over U.S. history have led to the adoption of new policies and revised curriculum in schools across the country. These new guidelines are raising concerns among families and educators. Many worry about the erasing and rewriting of history. Why is history still important and needed today? What are the consequences of politicizing history? And how can we encourage discernment in today's highly charged political world? This is what I want to know. And today I'm joined by Jessica Lander to find out. Jessica Lander is an author and teacher at Lowell High School in Massachusetts. Jessica teaches U.S. history and civics to recent immigrant students and has won several teaching awards, including being named the 2023 Massachusetts History Teacher of the Year. She joins us today to discuss the importance of teaching history to students. Jessica, welcome to the show. Jessica Lander, thank you so much for joining us on What I Want to Know, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk with you today. I've been waiting for this show. I've been waiting to interview you. I think that the work you're doing is so, so very important. But I always have to go back to the beginning. Uh, I ask all great teachers, all great educators, that one question, did you always want to be a teacher? So no, but I had phenomenal teachers growing up. Um, so I, from my parents, um, I mean, our parents and our families are always first in, our first and most important teachers. Um, and my parents were extraordinary teachers for me. And then in elementary school, I had really fantastic teachers who taught me both to love learning, that taught me that what I was excited about was worthy of study, and also, which I think was really important for me and I didn't appreciate till later on, um, so I'm dyslexic and struggled with speaking and reading and writing and spelling. Um, and never in elementary school did I feel that um, being dyslexic was a barrier for me achieving in the classroom and outside okay. the classroom. And that's a, um, I, I recognize the privilege of having been in a, a school community where my teachers celebrated all types of learners and so had amazing teachers growing up and then in high school and college, but didn't actually think about being a teacher until freshman year of college. And I'd originally gone um, with the uh, belief that I was going to be a science major. Oh, wow. Um, and um, was doing a language study program in Tanzania, studying Kiswahili. I knew being dyslexic that immersion was the best way for me to learn. And so it was in Tanzania and Arusha between uh, the fall and spring semester and uh, met a friend there who then showed me a school um, that was nearby. And I took a tour of the school and it was a really fascinating school that was created for low income students in the area and was doing really, really well. And students were thriving um, on national exams and um, in the community. And I came away, I viscerally remember that first day, um, having taken that tour of the school, coming back that evening to where I was staying and going, wow, I wanna understand what this school is doing and how, and how can we replicate these ideas? And I can't do that as a science major, as much as I love science. Um, and so I came back to university and I switched majors to anthropology with a certificate in African studies and wrote my thesis on the school and decided, okay, I'm gonna go into ed policy. Um, not teaching, but ed policy. But to be in ed policy, it was really essential that I have experience in the classroom, that no one should take me seriously. I, I wouldn't take myself seriously if I didn't have experience in the classroom. And so I um, applied for and got a fellowship to teach at Chiang Mai University in Thailand. Um, I graduated on a, a Tuesday, packed my bags, drove back to Massachusetts, unpacked my bags, repacked them, got on a plane Friday, landed in Thailand on Sunday and started teaching at university on Monday morning. Wow. And that was my first year teaching. And it, the plan was one year. And I 
remember the very last day, it was the last class, class had finished, and I drove my motorbike to a nearby temple um, near to in the neighborhood. And I just sat in the courtyard and cried because the community that my students and I had created together was gone. Um, that, that, that community that was so special and quirky and funny and rigorous and all of those things that we had together created, it was never gonna exist again. Mm. And I knew then that I had to go back to the classroom and stay in the classroom for longer. And so that was when I knew, really knew I needed to be a teacher. What's fascinating about your journey, a uh, couple things is, you know, all of us have those, I will call it seminal moments that change you and, and we remember them vividly. And especially when their moments guide your path and tell you this is what you should do. And as has been the case with me, and it sounds like it's been that way with you, when those moments happen, not only do you not look back, there are never any regrets. And I'm sure you would say that. Yep, absolutely. It, it just feels like this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. There's such joy in teaching. Um, there's such joy in watching my, my students become teachers to each other and then teachers and leaders in our community. And I, I definitely wouldn't have imagined it back in grade school or even my going into college, but couldn't imagine anything else now. Let, let me ask you this. What were you teaching when you began? What subjects were you teaching? So in Thailand at Chiang Mai University, I taught English and critical thinking classes um, and then a Shakespeare class, which um, I sort of created on the side and we, we put on a production um, of Macbeth. And then um, I came back to the U.S. and taught sixth grade and taught both English and math in an extended day program. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually flew back to Southeast Asia and lived in Cambodia and taught um, leadership skills um, and um, genocide studies to young women, college women in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I want to ask you about uh, when you began to teach history and why, but, you know, with your travels, and again, I find this with people who've traveled around the world, not only does it broaden one's horizons, but particularly for teachers, it helps your perspective in terms of compassion, empathy, you know, global understanding of the commonalities as well as the differences, and and that has guided your journey, even as you have uh, now excelled as, an, as a history teacher. But when did you start to teach history and why? Mm. Um, so I think there were always elements of history that I was teaching in sort of my, the earlier years of my teaching career. But I was not officially like a history teacher um, until I got to Lowell High School, where I teach now. Um, so I had definitely woven history into my classes. I, I love history. Um, I, as a, a seventh and eighth grader, my teacher, Jen K. Goodman, had us use Facing History and Ourselves, this really fantastic national organization. They have a, a curriculum um, based if, first in genocide studies and um, the Holocaust, um, and then sort of broadening out to more social justice. Um, and so it always really found the teaching and the learning of history really important and read a lot of history. But the first time that I taught history as a history teacher was when I got to Lowell. And that was, you were talking about how our experiences, um, and particularly for those of us who have lived abroad and had that opportunity, how that uh, impacts um, us. It definitely impacted um my ending up in Lowell, which I'm, I'm so, so grateful for, that I had gone to get a master's in education policy and management and was figuring out where I was going to teach next and what I was going to teach. Was it going to be English? Maybe it was going to be art. Um, I'm also a practicing artist. And I happened to have a conversation with uh, one of the, the women uh, who was at a recruiting fair from Lowell Public Schools, which has uh, the second largest Cambodian community outside Cambodia. And mm. having recently lived in Cambodia, um, this was really exciting for me to be able to, to learn from and learn with 
a community that not just was a, a vibrant Cambodian community, but also a vibrant community of peoples from all over the world. Um, and I think, too, being drawn from having lived in a number of countries. And I, the position that was open was a position to teach recent immigrant and refugee students um, and teaching history. Yeah. And I uh, sort of talking about those, those seminal moments, those moments that are, are so crystal clear in our memory and are transformative. Another of those for me was my, who would become my two heads of department, uh, Stephen Gervais and Robert DeLosa. Um, and they're the head of the Yale department and the social studies department. And I knew very little about Lowell at the time. I'd been a couple of times, uh, but they agreed to meet me halfway between where I was and the city of Lowell <laughs> on a Saturday morning at a coffee shop. And uh, it just speaks volumes to who they both are and how much they care about the community and their students that they would have a conversation with someone who may or may not be a teacher at their school mm. on a Saturday that they'd drive halfway to meet me and tell me about their school. And that hour, hour and a half conversation we had changed my life uh, because I came up to Lowell and found the, the work that I hope to do for the rest of my life. It's powerful in so many ways. And uh, because of your experiences and because you were teaching history to immigrants, you, you've you taken that ball and run with it um, uh, extraordinarily, if, uh, if I may. Uh, and you became uh, an author. You've written several things. Your one book, uh, uh, most recent book, Making Americans, where you unpack the journey, the immigrant journey, and you tell stories about some of specific you know, individuals sharing their humanity, uh, their experiences, court decisions that gave rise to uh, the uh, ability or requirement and the legal right mm -hmm. to make sure that our immigrant children were educated properly in this country. Uh, what motivated you to go through that sort of extraordinary task of writing a book, and I can say that because I'm, I'm an author myself, it, it takes a certain level of commitment uh, as well as a desire to share information that you feel must be shared. No, and that's absolutely it. Um, it really, it has for a long time felt like the book that I needed to write, um, not just a book that I wanted to write um, or I was looking to write a book, that it, it needed to be written, that these stories were so important. Um, so that, that comes from my students. Um, I, so I started in Lowell at Lowell High School um, in 2015. I have students uh, from 30 different countries, from Colombia to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to Cambodia. And they are remarkable young people. Um, they bring such strengths to our classroom and to our community. Uh, they are cultural linguistic navigators for their mm. families and for themselves and for their friends. They bring a wealth of knowledge, having lived in multiple countries and cultures and traditions. They bring grit and perseverance and determination honed in living in a new land. And they bring all these strengths that enrich our, our classroom and our learning together. And I am just blown away by them every day and seeing the ways in which they do remarkable things in their own educational journeys, but also the ways in which they support each other's educational journeys mm -hmm. and the ways in which they are really invested in creating new homes and new lives here and giving back to uh, their new homes uh, in Lowell and in Massachusetts and the U.S. And so the ways in which they, they want to help create positive change in the community and to engage and collaborate with members of the community. And so seeing all of this, seeing the work they did in our classroom, the ways in which they brought that learning and teaching out into the community is so inspiring to me and was one of the drivers of the book. And then the other was seeing all the amazing things they do and also recognizing that 
Are our schools generally many of them are not yet supporting our amazing immigrant origin students in all the ways that they they can and should be mm -hmm. um, today in the United States? One in four students are immigrants or the children of immigrants. One in four, and every community has uh, immigrant origin students. Immigrants or children of immigrants. And they bring all of these strengths. And it is important for schools to be playing a really essential role in making sure that young people feel a strong sense of belonging in our schools, that they feel valued, that they feel their strengths are recognized and appreciated and invested in, that they feel safe and they feel that they can really put down roots. And this is best for them and it's best for the, the whole community and the whole country. And so it was sort of those, those two um, those two beliefs that drove me to want to write this book. And then also, in addition to those, of just my own curiosity as a teacher of wanting to learn from other educators across the country of how I could be a better teacher for my students. Yeah. And so it was, it was those three things. And then um, I, I was fortunate to receive an Emerson Collective uh, Fellowship and so was able to actually take off a year with the support of my school district to begin researching the book. And then I finished writing it while full-time teaching. But yeah. that was, that's what drove me to write the book. It's, it's very, very inspiring. And speaking of curiosity, um, and the stories aside, because you knew many of the students, obviously, what was... Talk about your biggest takeaway based on the research mm. in the book. Because, uh, you know, have, having some understanding of, of, of the process you may have, uh, may have gone through, it's always interesting to me that you enter into a project like that and you have certain expectations. You also have a certain knowledge level that you want to, or a base of knowledge you want to share. But once you begin the research for something like that, there's always things that like, oh, wow. Spe I mean, I didn't know. I mean, talk about a couple, one or, or more of those things. Absolutely. And I think to to frame that, it might be useful for readers. So basically, the the book tells three sets of stories. It um, To reimagine immigrant education, um, my belief it's important to have these three sets of stories. Stories of the past. As you mentioned, those key laws, Supreme Court cases and movements that have transformed immigrant education. So those stories of the past, stories of the present, uh, innovative and creative approaches to immigrant education today in schools across the country, from a single classroom in North Dakota to an entire school district in North Carolina of 126 schools. And then, of course, stories of the personal, which you mentioned, which are those stories of our young people that if we're serious about reimagining immigrant education, we have to be learning from our young people about their experience of our schools um, so that we can better support them or better support uh, their near peers. And so um, you're right, the, the stories of my young people, I had a sense of my young people. Um, I mean, I, I learned so much more from them. Um, and about their experiences and their strengths in talking with them. I sat with each of them for about 20 hours of conversations um, over a long period of time. Um, but the, the history part, that research, I mean, as a history teacher, um, I, I really nerded out. Um, and I'm like already a history teacher. So um, I, I just, it was, it was really powerful to dive into this history, and I, I sort of call it historical sleuthing, um, <laughs> that I, I didn't know, to your point of like, what, what do we know and what do we not know going into a project like this? Um, so I, I knew that there were impo important moments in history that I wanted to cover. But I think one of the things that has really struck me is that a lot of the history that I learned for the book, I did not know before researching and writing the book. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know it. Yeah. It's essential history for us to know. It's essential to be taught in schools, and I try now to take a lot of that history that I learned and bring it into my curriculum. Um, and it's essential for adults to know. Yes. And so I think one of those big takeaways for me was just all of this essential history about immigrant education, about immigration, um, that has transformed our schools, transformed our communities, in some cases transformed my own family. 
Um, and I share a little bit about my own family's journey. My great grandfather, Daniel, came as a refugee from what is now Ukraine when he was seven years old, um, back mm. at the, the turn of the 1900s. Um, and his experience in schools, I have a much better understanding with um, now having learned this, this history that I didn't know before. And so that's a huge takeaway for me. I think there's uh, a takeaway of just seeing how whether it's xenophobic rhetoric um, that we're seeing now that we think maybe is new, is not. Um, it, it's happened before. Yes. Um, and so seeing that cyclical nature um, and also seeing the ways in which um, courageous individuals have built on each other's um, work over time. And so I think one of the things... Um, this is getting into the the nerdy history writing me, but um, the last chapter, the last piece of history that I write was really exciting for me both to write but also to learn because all of these people who I had been sitting with and learning with, who well, like 100 years old people, um, but had been learning their stories um, we're all showing up in this last history to be able to tell that last history, which uh, tells uh, a story that spans about 50 years and brings us to the present. Um, so many characters that I had met along this journey came back that it was all building on each other. And I, I couldn't have written that last chapter without understanding all those stories that came before. Yeah. Um, and I think the last thing that really struck me um, was just how uh, just how m really a magical um, and powerful it was to learn from folks who were at the heart of these cases. So as much yeah. as possible, I I sought out and was able to talk to folks who were part of these stories, parents yeah. and students and teachers and lawyers and activists. And that was really just such an honor and such a privilege to be able to talk with these these folks who they and their families shaped history. Um, and, and they made history. They made history. And it, it was just like, uh, for me as a history teacher, for me as a writer, to be able to have that honor of being able to speak with them and learn from them um, was extraordinary. You know, um, I find myself, and, and I really want to get to, to where we are today with respect to history, but I find myself using this phrase far more than I ever thought I would. And that phrase is, if we don't understand and know history, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes of history. And with all this going on, uh, the you know challenges to curriculum, uh, in some cases, the dumbing down of history, um, the editing, deleting, depending on your community or the tribe you're in, Whatever, some things you like, some things you don't like. And, you know, educators, many teachers uh, fall into that category. Uh, I've had teachers say, well, because I have a certain feeling about this religion, I don't want to talk about, I don't even want to mention the word. Some people don't want to talk about Holocaust or slavery. Uh, there's so much of the politics and the angst around history. Talk to me about why the teaching of history, the facts of history, <laughs> what really <laughs> happened in as, you know, complete and honest way as possible. Talk about why that's still important today. Yeah, I mean, it's always been important and will always be important. And I'm 100 percent with you. I mean, I having, so this organization, Facing History and Ourselves, if listeners haven't um, heard of it, I, I urge you to go look it up. They're a really fantastic organization. And I, I learned from them very early on. And so I think they were really, they shaped my, my belief about the importance of facing hard history um, and, and studying all of history. So studying the innovative, the, the positive, and the challenging and the hard, even when it's uncomfortable, especially when it's uncomfortable. Um, to your point exactly of then we're doomed to repeat ourselves, that we have so much to learn from our history. And it, 
it is it, not speaking about it, not reading about it, denying it exists, doesn't make it go away. Um, and it makes it more likely that we are to repeat ourselves. Um, and so I, in my class, I mean, I see it every day when my kids face hard history and grapple with challenging questions that they grow from that. And we do it in a community, in a, a space where they're able to ask those questions and to grapple with each other. Um, but if we are really building, uh, uh, helping to, to support students in becoming active civic participants in our democracy, in our country, in our communities, then they need to know the past to be able to shape our future. So let me ask you this. Just okay. How do you distinguish between the telling of history mm -hmm. and the editorializing of history? Because people, yeah. there, there's some blurred lines happening here with folks who say, you know, we want to delete this or we don't want so-and-so to teach this because the assumption is that if you even raise some of these issues that, have taken place in history that the teller, the teacher, were editorialized. But there is a distinction there. Yeah, I think like there is for, for teachers, there are amazing primary sources that we can um, explore. There are great websites that um, gather lots of primary sources. And so bringing those into the classroom, um, as well as, of course, um, secondary sources. Um, I, I th it's just... It is. It's so essential to be to be to be grappling with the, the the big challenges in history, and that's also what's really important about the study of history. And I think also what grips my students. Um, I, I remember a, a student sort of thinking about the same way that many of these stories in my book I had not known and was not taught before I studied it. One of my students last year. Um, hadn't heard of the the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Mm. Um, and he has some family that is Japanese and of Japanese descent. And he was he was shocked. Um, it, it was like, no, this, this couldn't have happened. And this was a, a young man who had, had been, you know, like not so invested in <laughs> class yet. Um, <laughs> but he was suddenly really engaged and wanted and was asking more questions and staying back after class. And uh, I have a, a social justice library in my class with lots of books where I hope my kids will see themselves in the titles and the stories in the book. And I, I pulled out uh, one book um, about uh, a memoir and he, he wanted to check it out um, and brought it home with him and his excitement and engagement and just really recognizing that this was important. Yes, it was his history, but I've seen the same for my kiddos who the the history that we're grappling with is not necessarily their history um, mm -hmm. in terms of like their ancestors or their family's history, um, but they too, they recognize how important it is to, to study this. Um, and so it's how do we create more opportunities for students to do this in classrooms? Um, and how to, to use this as opportunities for empathy building yes, um, and connections between our, our past and our present. And then also provide students not just the, the sort of the talking about in the present, but the tools with, the, okay, so how do we shape our future? If you want it to look different, how do we shape that? And, and that takes intentional uh, skill building. And so I teach, um, there's a great organization, Generation Citizen, that does action civics work across the country. And my students every year in second semester choose together one community issue they care about and to collaboratively and together they work on identifying a root cause and a goal and then working with local officials to advocate for real systemic change. And so it's, it's really helping my, my kids want to create positive change. They want to help their communities they don't necessarily have the tools yet. And so it's how do we help give them the tools to then be able to shape that future? Yeah, I, think I think that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely essential. I think that the one thing, if you're around students enough, you find that oftentimes we insult their intelligence 
by not empowering them to be able to think and collaborate and problem solve. And I think, uh, fortunately, I think education in America is headed in that direction. Uh, Jessica, one last question. Uh, this is what I really want to know. Um, from your vantage point, and there are a lot of school administrators, school leaders, teachers that will be listening to this. What can we do to ensure and keep the accurate telling of history in America's classrooms? Mm, so many things. Um, I think one is to, to seek out and know our history. Um, and so to be avid and vir uh, voracious readers um, ourselves as, as educators, as school leaders, and then also to encourage the same for our students, um, that I'm always trying to learn more in the same way as sort of striking when I was writing Making Americans of all of these essential stories that I didn't know. So, uh, and I'll just give you one as an example. As a kid, I was really taught about Ellis Island. Um, mm. And some of my family came through Ellis Island, but I wasn't really ever taught about Angel Island in San Francisco which where Ellis Island was really mostly a place of welcome, Angel Island was really a detention center um, and mostly for immigrants coming from China. And uh, they're starkly different in how they treated immigrants. So if you were in Ellis Island, you stayed on average two hours to two days. And on Angel Island, you could stay anywhere on average between two weeks to two years detained mm. in Angel. Um, and I, I give that as an example of just one piece of history that I didn't know was not taught, but is I, I learned at a conference I went to and is now an uh, essential part of my curriculum when we study immigration in the early 1900s. We will study that in about two, three weeks in my classes. Um, and so seeking out um, those stories, seeking out books, challenging ourselves to grapple with hard history so that we can then bring it into the classroom. Um, and then I think, too, is listening to our young people. Uh, just as you said, like our young people are deeply intelligent and so, so curious. And so as much as possible, helping to create space spaces in our classrooms for school leaders um, or in our, our classrooms as teachers, um, creating those spaces in our curriculum for our students to help lead in the creation of our, our lessons and our materials. So there's a, a class I teach. Um, I mostly teach a U.S. history class to recent immigrant and refugee students, and then one class um, which dives into um, all sorts of um, history, a lot of hard history in the U.S. And every Friday, uh, a group of my students will take over and teach the class. Mm -hmm. And within whatever unit we're looking at, um, they have to choose a, a topic related to that. But they'll work with me over the course of a week to develop a whole lesson plan and activities. But they are choosing what they think is important for their peers to learn. And we're doing that in collaboration and discussion. Um, and it's like deeply, deeply rigorous. And uh, I just explained this project today to my students. And <laughs> there were a lot of like very big eyes. Um, but it it reminds me of many, many ways um, back to my elementary school. And what I was mentioning at the beginning of our conversation of my teachers um, creating opportunities to let us explore what we were passionate about. Yeah. And so similarly, and this is just one example of what I try to do in my class of creating space for my students to explore the history that they are curious about. And that's one part of it. It's also us as teachers bringing in lots of perspectives and ideas and grappling with that hard history. But I also think it's important to be really creating space for student voice and student ownership of their learning. Yeah. Jessica Lander, well said. Thank you so much for joining us on What I Want to Know. Thank you so much for having me. It was just a pleasure, a real pleasure and joy to be in conversation with you. Thanks for listening to What I Want to Know. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app so you can explore other episodes and dive into our discussions on the future of education. And write a review of the show. I also encourage you to join the conversation and let me know what you want to know using hashtag WIWTK on social media. That's hashtag WIWTK. 
For more information on Stride and online education, visit stridelearning.com. I'm your host, Kevin P. Chavis. Thank you for joining What I Want to Know.